Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be here speaking to you today. Thank you to the organizing committee. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Igor Verlev, for this invitation. And the topic of my talk is going to be about radical tocalectomy. Um, as they mentioned, uh, my name is Gloria Salvo. I work at MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. I'm going to talk a little bit about history and indications of this surgery, oncologic and obstetrical outcomes. Um, I'm going to talk if it is safe to perform it as is published uh, in the literature in pregnant patients. And also if we can go a little bit, bit less radical, as again it was mentioned in previous talks. We're talking a little bit about two studies that are ongoing, or one is already done, the conserve and the shape trial, and minimal invasive. Another question that is, has been raised, and of course, after all these talks, it's an, an important topic, is about if it is safe to perform radical trochalectomies via a minimal invasive approach. And again, I'm going to mention an ongoing study, that is the IRTA trial. Very briefly, you know, cervical cancer is the fourth most, most common uh, cancer, and most important, 38% of patients diagnosed with cervical cancer are women that are less than 48, 45 years old, so they are in their fertility years. And there's a trend on delayed pregnancy seen in the last few years or decades, and for that reason, fertility sparring treatments appear as an option to radical hysterectomy. First described by Daniel Darjant in 1994, the vaginal radical uh, trachelectomy that you all know is the removal of the cervix, parametrial tissue, and upper vaginal, and then the uterus is reattached to the vagina. And after uh, this first publication, there has been several others uh, on Speed et al. published in 1997 on uh, open radical trochalectomy, Jim Pearson 2008 on robotic radical trochalectomy, and in 2010 on laparoscopic radical trochalectomy. And there has been many publications for the three approaches. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN guideline, um, has this fertility in the fertility sparring option. You know that there, of course, the radical hysterectomy is a standard treatment, but it has the radical trochalectomy as an option for stage 1B1 and 1B2. This is the FIGO, uh, the new staging for the FIGO 2018, and also as an option. I don't know if you can see here, uh, as an option to stages 1A1 with LVSI or stage 1A2. This is a new study um, that's uh, published by Jason Wright. It uh, talks about the trends in use and survival associated with fertility sparring trachelectomy, and it's it was done using the National Cancer Database. It included 15,000 patients, both going hysterectomy versus trachelectomy. And what it shows is the trend in radical trachelectomy. So over the years, since 2004 till 2014, you can see the trend that is raising. And this trend is the greatest increase is seen when patients are younger than 30 years old. When talking about mortality, the same publication shows that there was no difference in the rate of mortality when comparing hysterectomy versus trachelectomy. And when talking about oncologic outcomes, this is a, a, a very nice a review written by Dr. Enrica Ventivegna and colleagues. It's a systematic review, including 3,000 patients. They compare six different fertility sparring procedures as you can see here, we are going to talk and mention especially radical trachelectomy by pointing out some uh, a little bit things of the other two. They have, uh, as you can see, there's several um, patients included in the in their review. 
And here, this is the table only comparing radical trachelectomies via a vaginal approach, 1,500 patients, open, 866 patients, laparoscopy, 252 patients, and robotic, 101 patients. Talking about vaginal radical trachelectomy, very briefly, the um, oncologic outcomes, that is what the review is about, they, it has a recurrence rate of 4%. And when they compare, because 84 of the patients published uh, on vaginal radical trachelectomy especially specified that the tumor size was greater than two centimeters. So when comparing um, oncologic outcomes in tumors greater than two versus l um, less than two centimeters, they found that the recurrence rate in greater than two centimeters was 17% compared to 4%. So this is statistically significant. And of course, Tumor size greater than two percent should be a contraindication for vaginal radical trachelectomy. Then appears the abdominal radical trachelectomy that meant to be more radical in terms of parametrial resection, and so indicated for patients with unfavorable prognostic factors, as is tumor size greater than two, LVSI positive, or both. And when talking about <clears throat> open uh, radical trachelectomy, there's um, some issues or considerations that appear in the published literature. That is, is it good to preserve the urinary artery or is it okay if we ligate it? On this, uh, there are two publications on reanastomosis. Okay, well, so when looking at all these studies, when preserving the urinary artery, the operating time is longer, the estimated blood loss is higher, and for so it has declined in the past five years. And the choice has been to ligate the urinary arteries in the past five years of the newest publications on open trachelectomy. Um, there has been reported more severe complications than with the vaginal approach, especially with uh, deep side in infections like abscess. And another um, highlighted point in the in the literature is complications with the cerclage, like cerclage erosions and cervical stenosis. Those have been reported higher uh, than in the vaginal approach. Regarding oncologic outcomes, the recurrence rate 5%, pretty similar. But um, when talking about tumor size, uh, tumors greater than two centimeters, the recurrence rate was lower than the vaginal approach for these um, tumors, bigger tumors. And this is a new study. It's a retrospective study by Dr. Yo Wahoo, including 333 patients ongoing open radical trachelectomies. Um, as I say, they include 333, and their recurrence rate is 3.3%. And when comparing tumors greater or smaller than 2 centimeters, they found no uh, difference in the recurrence rate. They did find uh, a difference. This was the only difference found um, when the patient has an uh, adenosquamous carcinoma in comparison to uh, squamous or adenocarcinoma, especially in tumors greater than two centimeters. Uh, regarding laparoscopic radical trachelectomy, data is available. It's, it's newer, so the data is available since 2002. Most cases in the laparoscopic approach preserve the urine artery. Um, there has been uh, published a 3% of close or positive margins for this approach. And regarding oncologic outcomes, this is very important. The follow-up is shorter than in the previous ones. It's less than 24 months. And the recurrence rate is 6%, pretty similar to the previous reported for the other two approaches. But the recurrence rate, again, for tumors greater than 2 centimeters is high, so 17%, as in the vaginal approach. And in the robotic radical trachelectomy series reported, the data is available since 2008, so newer. And 20% of 1B1 tumors has close or positive margins. Remember I said 3% for the laparoscopic approach. And only one of these series reported on follow-up. 
and it was longer than 34 months, but it was only one of nine series published. So the conclusion for the robotic approach in this review is this robotic uh, radical trachelectomy is still in its feasibility stage. When talking about uh, fertility um, outcomes, uh, obstetrical outcomes, that is the main issue why this surgery uh, firstly was described or for young patients that wish to maintain fertility without compromising oncologic outcomes. Again, Enrica Ventivegna did this systematic review including 2,775 patients achieving 944 pregnancies. These are all, um, again, it's the same table or similar with the vaginal radical trachelectomy in comparison to the open approach and the minimal invasive. Here are both together, laparoscopic and robotic. As you can see, of course, there are more patients in the vaginal group, 1,000. In comparison to the minimal invasive, that is only 314 patients. And they're reporting the pregnancy rate and the prematurity, uh, prematurity rate and they've seen that the pregnancy rate in the open approach is 44%, statistically significantly less than in the vaginal and the minimal invasive approach. And this is, we're not talking about, we're talking about radical trachelectomy, just to show you that they also um, published the results when neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy was uh, done plus or followed by a fertility sparring treatment that could be a conization, a simple trachelectomy, or a radical trachelectomy. And the results are even better. So the pregnancy uh, rate is higher, 77% in comparison to the open that I said is 44, or the MIS is 67. And there are few prematurity, um, the prematurity rate is, is less. So the obstetrical outcomes with neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by fertility sparring surgery, um, it's better. In this review, they conclude that there's no impact of urine, urinary preservation and pregnancy rate. There was no impact of surclash in cervical stenosis. Um, and they did show, and there's another study that report this, that anti-stenosis tools like a Foley catheter, a urine, intra-urine device, or smear slips decrease the stenosis rate. Um, they also show no di impact of, on, of urinine surclash in live birth rate. And this is a question that arises after uh, how do we do surveillance in radical trachelectomy of patients that underwent radical trachelectomy, pap smear, no pap smear. This is a study from Andy Anderson, including 41 patients where abnormal pap smears were found in 59% of patients. And some patients had more than one abnormal pap smear. This, in the table, you can see the most common uh, abnormality seen. And uh, none of these patients, um, after the follow-up time, have any recurrence. So they have abnormal pap smears, but no recurrences. So it shows that the rate of abnormal PAP uh, should be expected as high after this procedure, but has limited, limited, um, limited clinical relevance or significance. And one of the questions that I mentioned before is if is this radical trachelectomy is safe in patient pa uh, women, as is reported in the literature. I'm going to mention it very briefly. Cancer during pregnancy, I'm not talking much in front of Dr. Amant, but it's, the rate is it's rare. It's one in around uh, 1,000 pregnancy. The incidence has increased in recent decades. It's maybe delay, um, related to this uh, delay in pregnancy. And uh, cancer, this is, this cervical cancer is the third most common cancer in pregnancy. So again, uh, it's an important topic. And this is the first uh, abdominal radical trachelectomy series by Dr. Laszlo Unger reported in 2006. It included five cases and after him, there has been published several or 28 uh, patients in total in several series and this is a um, a uh, review article by Dr. Radolakis 
included, as I said, 28 cases in the three open vaginal and laparoscopic approach. And as you can see, we're not going uh, deep in this table, but just the highlighted part uh, is uh, related to obstetrical outcomes, five miscarriages, 14 preterm, so birth before the week 37, and one fetus death. So it has very poor obstetrical outcomes, 20 out of 28 patients, that's around 71% of poor obstetrical outcomes. In this guideline written by Dr. Frederica Mant, this is the second guideline of the second international consensus meeting, they mentioned that radical chocolectomy during pregnancy has a significant blood loss and prolonged surgery. The surgical results are poor, 32% uh, in uh, six in eight, 19 cases described, results in early abortions. And for that reason, uh, the, the guideline does not recommend radical chocolectomy during pregnancy. We are in the Anderson. We report in 2018. Uh, this publication is a series of five cases uh, that pregnant patients underwent simple trachelectomy. Here you can see uh, we were not the first to describe it. There are some others, nine cases in total. Um, as I said, these five patients underwent simple tra vaginal trachelectomy with a laparoscopic or robotic uh, pelvic lymphadenectomy. Um, all patients are no evidence of disease at this moment. As you can see the table, uh, the follow-up is 75 months with a minimum or, or the range from 14 to over 100 months. Now this is not 14 anymore, it is 34 months and the patient is still uh, without evidence of disease. And regarding minimal invasive surgeries, it is, uh, the question is, is this, it's safe to perform minimal invasive uh, radical trachelectomies. And after all you've heard before, we had to talk about this a little bit. And this is, again, um, a, a National Cancer Database a study published by Dr. Wright. Um, it includes patients with stages 1A2 to 1B. They included a total of 246 patients. Uh, 144 underwent minimal invasive approach and 102 open approach. There are in both arms or both groups uh, patients with tumors greater than two centimeters, around 30%. And what it shows is that in the United States, a minimal invasive radical trachelectomy became the dominant approach in around 2011. And when talking about uh, oncologic outcomes, um, the minimally invasive and the open approach showed um, a 3.5% for the minimally invasive versus a 7.6% for the minimally invasive approach. So it appears to be no difference. And what this is very interesting, these authors in their discussion mentioned that their results, as you can see here, are under power. I mentioned 200 patients, to small sample size to draw any clinical, clinically meaningfully uh, conclu meaningful conclusion, conclusion. And I guess Peter mentioned it several times, given the favorable prognosis of radical uh, trachelectomy, those the recurrence rates are um, few or are not high, um, they did this, this assumption in the discussion, and if, as an ex, it's just an example, but assuming a one-to-one -one case mix for open and minimally invasive trachelectomy, if you want to have a study with an 80% power, they estimated that the sample site needed is going to be 39,000 patients to get a, a, to detect a 10% difference in four-year mortality, so that's a huge number and the study was, this study was no power um, to answer that question. So the conclusion of the others is the, although the study showed no difference in survival between the both minimal invasive and open groups, um, the effect of minimal invasive on survival remains unknown and further studies are needed. So we are conducting, Dr. René Pareja from Colombia, eh, Pedro Ramirez, and myself, we are conducting this um, international radical trachelectomy assessment called the IRTA study. We already published uh, in the International Journal as a clinical trial. 
This is a multi-institutional, international, retrospective study uh, whose primary objective is to compare the Swiss free survival. And we are including patients in stage 1A2 or 1BA. This is the previous classification, so tumors of two or less than two centimeters. Um, comparing open versus minimal invasive, and minimal invasive includes both the parascopic or robotic approach. These are our inclusion criteria. We're including patients from January 2005 to December 2017. Um, we're including patients, of course, with radical trachelectomy and pelvic lymph node uh, dissection with or without sentinel lymph node mapping from squamous adenocarcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma. Three histologies are included. Stages, as I mentioned, 1A2 um, to 1B1, less than two centimeters in the preoperative setting. And this can be physical exam, uh, images, or a cone. Either one of the three has to be shown that the tumor was less than two centimeters. And the centers need to contribute with 15 cases or more, either uh, approach. So this is, this is what we have so far. We have uh, 25 sites in 13 countries, uh, and we have 715 uh, patients included. We did, although it's not a, ret a prospective uh, trial, we did a, a, a part calculation, and we need around 500 patients to get a 80%. So we are over that number. We have, um, as you can see, sites from around the world, and as mentioned here, Russia, uh, Dr. Igor Brelev and um, Elena Ulrich are participating as well as Dilara Kaidarova from Kazakhstan. We are aiming to present uh, these results in the next IGCS meeting in Rio 2019 and publish the manuscript after. And very briefly, if we can go less than this, so the IRTA will kind of answer a question on approach, but can we go less than radical trachelectomy? And there are, as mentioned before, two studies, including patients with two or less than two centimeter uh, tumors. One is a conserved study, that's a single arm study uh, from MD Anderson, Dr. Kathleen Schmeller, will present the results in the IGC, uh, IGCS uh, meeting this year. 100 patients uh, were uh, included in the study, and that's completed. And the study, um, the patients underwent conization or simple hysterectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection, again, with or without sentinel lymph node mapping. Uh, but this is not a randomized study. Uh, and the second one, uh, the SHAPE trial. This is a randomized trial by Marie Plant. Uh, they aim to accrue uh, 700 patients. The patients uh, are undergoing radical hysterectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection versus simple hysterectomy uh, and nodes and pelvic lymph node dissections as well. So. Uh, in tumors less than two centimeters, these two studies will uh, answer the, the question that if we can go less radical in this patient population. And regarding tumors greater than two centimeters, this is another trial um, by Marie Plant. It's a, a starting trial. It's already published in the International Journal of Gynecologic and Cancer as well. So you can download and read it, but briefly I'm gonna go over it. And Dr. Frederick Amand is also a, a, a co-investigator for the study. So any questions or if you wanna participate, more than welcome. This is a multi-center prospective single arm, arm phase two trial. The primary objective is to evaluate the feasibility of preserving fertility. And they're including patients with figure stage 1B2. Uh, this is two to four centimeter tumors, clinical and uh, images, uh, with negative notes. And it has to be patients, of course, premenopausal, less than 40 years old. Um, and they must achieve to uh, continue to, the, I'm gonna show you a little bit of how it works. I think it's easier this way. So the patients are undergoing three cycles of platinum paglitaxel chemotherapy. They, they'll have an MRI, a pelvic MRI, and if they achieve optimal response, that is, is uh, of course, no residual disease in the images or less than two centimeter, they're gonna go a large conization or simple trachelectomy. If there's suboptimal response, so a radical hysterectomy with or without a chemo radiation therapy or chemo radiation therapy alone. 
The sample size is 90 patients, and the expected complete accrual is 2022, and the result will be presented in 2025. So as a conclusion, the patient selection is the most important thing in radical trachelectomy to avoid positive margins and adjuvant treatment to um, be able to maintain fertility. Uh, the urinary preservation has no or has no shown to have any impact in fertility rate. Radical trachelectomy is definitely not recommended in pregnant patients. And uh, minimal invasive uh, surgery has higher pregnancy rates than open, the open approach. That is important. That's why the question and um, the better obstetrical outcomes, anyway, they're obtained with new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, continue or plus a fertility uh, sparring treatment that could be a conization, a simple trachelectomy or a radical trachelectomy. There are questions that remain unknown, and is one is can we go less radical? We are waiting for the conserve, the shape trial, and the Contessa, the last one I mentioned. And if MAS is safe for this population, we are waiting on our results, although it's, keep in mind, it's a retrospective study, um, but we will see what it shows in the IGC meeting that everyone is more than welcome to assist. And I want to uh, give my special, special thanks. It has been an amazing trip to Russia. <laughs>